Jeanette, you may begin, please. Okay, thank you, Jordan. So, uh, welcome everyone. We appreciate you giving some time here to uh, be at this webinar and hear a little bit about some of the Corps of Engineers hydropower capabilities. Purpose, purpose. HTC, I think you're going to need to stay muted until I pass it over to you. Perfect. I think we were getting an echo there. So, um, when I'm ready to pass it over to HTC, I'll let you know, and then you can unmute your speakers, and you guys will be able to join in as presenters. So again, thanks everyone for joining us. Uh, um, our intent today is to go over some of the Corps of Engineers hydropower uh, experience and expertise that we have across the Corps of Engineers, and I have a couple different presenters here with me today. Again, my name is Jeanette. I manage the Energy and Sustainability Program for Northwestern Division. We have John Etzel, who's the Deputy Director of the Hydroelectric Design Center, and Charlie Allen, who is a mechanical engineer with the Hydroelectric Design Center, who are both here. And Jim Carter, unfortunately, was not able to uh, get his microphone up and connected in, a, in time to be able to participate today. So he's not able to join us today, but he uh, will be joining us next week, likely, for, um, to be a participant in the discussion and maybe online here later this morning or today as well. So before we jump into specifically the hydropower slides, I wanted to highlight a couple of things for you. Um, you may have heard about the new Regional Energy Sustainability and Lifecycle Cost Analysis Centers of Expertise. These Tuesday webinars, we have a variety of different presenters who are presenting at them, and some of them are part of these Regional Sustainability Centers of Expertise. We have built up these sustainability centers across the Corps of Engineers, uh, the purpose there is to make sure we have consistent competency across the Corps so that we are all doing sustainability in a consistent manner, and then also share information Corps-wide and outside of the Corps with customers and others as well. And so today you'll hear from the Northwestern Division, from our Regional Sustainability Center. We've been assigned, each region has been assigned specific sustainability areas and sustainability competencies. So if you work for the Corps and you work in a specific region, you can reach out to your uh, lead at the division and find out what those sustainability centers are. I've got them here on this slide, slide three, just to give you an idea of uh, what they are. And our intent here with these sustainability centers is to serve as a resource point for uh, the Corps and for our customers. So if you have questions about um, commissioning, North Atlantic Division has been assigned as the center for commissioning. and so. You can reach out to Tricia Donahue, and she can connect you with resources to provide you support and help on any commissioning questions that you may have. Uh, you can see on the bottom right, NWD has been assigned hydropower, and you're going to see clearly here as we go through our presentation today why we were assigned the responsibility for hydropower with the Hydroelectric Design Center right in our uh, area of responsibility. So the purpose of these, I want I highlight them to let you know that they are out there. Each of these centers is in the process of being built up and put together. And so we are developing websites. You can see the link on slide four here. So we're developing websites for each of the different centers to um, provide information sharing. So if you, there are discussion boards on those uh, SharePoint sites, there is, uh, sample specs, there are all kinds of different training and project information. We announce webinars through this through that website. So it's a good resource uh, as a customer, as a Corps of Engineers employee, it's a good resource to become familiar with and start looking around at. Our websites still are in development, so you'll find that there is still some work being done in those uh, websites, but it's a good place to take a look and see what we are doing and where we're at with our progress in telling people about these sustainability centers. So I wanted to highlight that for you so that you are aware of that resource that we have within the Corps of Engineers and give you a little context to the presentation that we are going to be sharing today. Why do I do all that? Um, I just want to highlight, again, those, the website is there, available for information for you. The centers are, are there as a resource, and we want to encourage you to reach out to them. So we are working on a formal and strategic communication plan to continue to raise awareness about these centers. One way we do that is here during the webinars. So I encourage you to take a look at that after we're done with our webinar today. 
So today we're going to go over some of the Corps of Engineers hydropower capabilities. We're going to talk through, I'm going to turn the mic over here in a little bit to HDC and give them an opportunity to discuss and provide us an overview of uh, hydropower within the Corps of Engineers. It's a mission that not always does everyone who works on military construction uh, know that we even have this capability or have this mission. And we're going to talk through what it is that we can provide and how we can help support projects talk through some of the reasons why we're, we want to highlight it, the increased interest for customers, and how customers are starting to ask more questions about hydropower and how we're able to uh, leverage our current capabilities in, to those different customers. And then we'll talk about ways that we can, uh, how to engage our hydroelectric design center and the regional center of expertise for sustainability if you have questions, if you want to talk through different projects or um, specific ideas, we'll, we'll have an opportunity to talk through how that can be done on projects and how you can engage HDC to get them involved in supporting a project for you. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to John Etzel and give him an opportunity to walk through some of our introductory hydropower slides. Uh, again, this, I'm John Etzel. I'm the Deputy Director for the Hydroelectric Design Center. Uh, uh, although we are part of uh, the Corps of Engineers, uh, we are a national asset to the Corps, but we're also an asset to uh, the, uh, the Army, the, the big Army, the large Army in itself. And so uh, as we go through the slides, um, we're going to talk about USACE Hydropower and its capabilities, but again, uh, just recognizing and, and understanding that we do support uh, Army, uh, we do support. We do some support for others as well too, uh, uh, related to the hydropower field. This slide shows uh, a uh, the U.S. sources of electrical hydropower. Uh, as you can see, the two pie charts. The pie chart on the left uh, we'll start with. Um, it shows the the different uh, sources of hydropower. You can see coal in the United States is almost half of the hydropower source provided and the rest is broken up uh, the other 50 percent. Uh, you can also look at uh, the hydropower, the conventional hydropower is about 6 percent and other renewable resources which is about 2.6 percent. Uh, what we're seeing, we're seeing trending of course uh, in the United States and, and that trending is certainly showing that we're seeing uh, reductions in the, the coal resources and increases in the uh, renewables uh, uh, portion of the pie chart. Uh, there will, will likely be some changes to natural gas as well too. Uh, but overall, just uh, to give you content, where hydropower itself is 6% of the U.S. source. If you take that 6% pie chunk and you move it to the right pie, and you break that up into 100%, you can see that roughly 50% of the hydropower source in the United States is federally owned and operated, and about 50%, a little over 50%, is non-federal hydropower, which is uh, licensed uh, with the FERC. Uh, and then the other point of note on this particular slide, you can see the Corps of Engineers <coughs> itself makes up 23% uh, or almost a quarter of the hydropower that's produced in the United States. So uh, the core is uh, the single largest owner operator of hydropower in the United States. This slide just kind of gives a breakdown of the uh, core's hydropower capability. As uh, the uh, bullets show, we actually own and operate 75 major hydropower plants in 22 of our 45 districts. Uh, we have uh, our makeup is 376 generating units. Uh, our generators range generally from uh, a little less than a megawatt to 220 megawatts, which one would consider large hydro. And we'll talk more about that and uh, the importance uh, of that or, or uh, how it relates to micro hydro uh, later on in the presentation. Uh, as you can see also there, the total uh, rated generation capacity is uh, over 21,000 megawatts. The graph uh, the, the, uh, below uh, the, uh, the map of the United States shows the locations of our facilities. And as you can see, the Northwest, it has 
you know, roughly a third of our facilities, but it produces roughly two thirds of our capacity. Uh, you can see uh, a lot of the, the, the remaining dots across the United States, they're smaller facilities, uh, but they, they are larger in number. This graphic just shows uh, our organization, uh, the uh, Corps of Engineers organization. Uh, we are headquartered in Washington, D.C. with the Chief of Engineers. Uh, we have eight different divisions and then under those divisions, uh, districts, uh, the 45 districts that I talked about. The, the red boxed uh, districts uh, show uh, the districts that, that we are currently supporting a hydropower mission in. So uh, but roughly half of our districts uh, in the district footprints are supporting hydropower. What this can also mean too is, and, and this will be, we'll talk further about this, Jeanette I'm sure will we'll speak more of this later on in the presentation, but um, the districts themselves are the full service engineering organizations. That means that they, they, they have uh, all the skills and, and uh, in-house requirements to uh, develop uh, plans and specifications and, and support uh, the planning efforts and the construction efforts. Uh, HDC, as, as I'll talk in a little bit, we are not a full service organization, but we're specifically focused on uh, hydropower. This slide shows uh, the Hydroelectric Design Center's uh, mission statement. We're a mandatory center of expertise. We perform planning, engineering, design, uh, and maintain uh, expertise develop standards for the Corps of Engineers hydroelectric uh, power plants and large pumping plants. What this means is, is that uh, we are a, a national asset to the Corps of Engineers. When we have planning, engineering, and design uh, items that have to be done uh, within the Corps related to hydropower, uh, that work comes to HDC. And it's just important to note that it, it is a very specialized um, uh, technology, a specialized skill set, and so that's why we have centralized uh, the capability here within HDC. Uh, we're a learning organization, uh, and so it's important for us to, to uh, we aren't building new uh, facilities uh, significantly. We're doing a lot of rehabs and other things. So it's important for us to maintain a technological base, uh, technological skill set directly related to hydropower, and that's uh, one of the primary functions of HDC. This slide shows uh, the fact that we're headquartered in uh, Portland, Oregon. There's 120 approximately staff folks. We do have a forward office of about five folks that are in Mobile, Alabama. And uh, although they're in, in Mobile, they're, they're still HDC uh, employees and their focus of work is hydropower. You can see the makeup of our staff. We have uh, 38 electrical engineers and 27 mechanicals. We have the largest uh, concentration of electrical and mechanical engineers uh, within the Corps of Engineers. And again, uh, what I want to point out is, is our, our expertise is uh, directly in the field of hydropower. Uh, what that means uh, really though is, is from a hydropower perspective, you know, we deal uh, from water to wire. So that means uh, any type of cranes or crane support, uh, we certainly work on those. Uh, trash racks, water passageways, uh, turbines in the wet, and then also in the dry, of course, uh, is the uh, electrical side and electrical components. We actually have um, uh, some uh, capability in the transmission, but that's really not our, our main role. The bottom bullet you can see, we utilize our uh, district staffs in, in, in engineering and construction when they have expertise available. Uh, we utilize AEs to help support our, our program, our annual program. We also look uh, at uh, university professors and others uh, to help us in terms of uh, executing our mission. This slide again shows our, our services. You can see our services include things uh, such as planning, uh, uh, recon. If, if, so if, for instance, folks are interested in knowing uh, are there, is there a potential to develop uh, hydropower, that uh, we have a team that, that can uh, go out and, and look at the site, uh, review the uh, specifications, 
of the particular site itself. We have a team that's res that uh, of economists that can look the, uh, from the numbers perspective, uh, and we uh, can we make assessments and, and make determinations in, in regards to uh, moving forward with projects or not. Uh, of course, the uh, engineering support is 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 really uh, the meat and potatoes of what we do. We are uh, plans and specifications developers. So we don't actually do the design of the, the individual components, but what we do is we identify uh, the particular specifications or the needs of the facility, uh, and then we prepare plans and specifications for manufacturers to bid on the contracts and then supply those contracts through construction. And then moving into construction, we, we actually provide construction support on the uh, commissioning. Uh, we also provide quality assurance, uh, review of submittals, and, uh, and uh, various field engineering support requirements. One of the big things that we're, of course, proud of, of, of what we do is uh, when your, your dryer breaks at, at your house, you call Maytag. Uh, what, uh, when your uh, hydropower facility uh, breaks, your unit breaks, you call the Hydroelectric Design Center. And we've got uh, some amazing folks uh, that uh, have this expertise that they can troubleshoot, figure out what is wrong, and then uh, work to get the uh, facilities online as quickly as possible. Uh-oh. Oh. This slide shows uh, trends in uh, U.S. hydropower. Uh, the first bullet talks about increased investment to rehabilitate and modernize. As I mentioned earlier on, we as the Corps of Engineers are not building new facilities. And our, our old facilities are, are uh, 50, 60, 70 years old and are in great need of uh, rehabilitation and, and repair. And that speaks from the uh, turbine side of the house, the wet side of the house, uh, and also the uh, generation side of the house or, or the dry side of the house. So much of the work that, that we are currently doing is invested in the rehabilitation of existing uh, facilities. Uh, we are very much into utilization of new technologies and whether that means uh, we are, are uh, working towards environmental things like fish friendly units or, or air uh, turbines and the like were involved with that, but also in the new technologies, uh, we are very uh, big on, on optimization. We have a hydropower optimization team that looks at the way we operate units, the way we operate projects uh, to, to work to uh, get the most energy out of our existing units and our existing facilities. Renewable energy integration is another one of those things that I mentioned on the, the one of the first slides. Uh, we're seeing more and more renewable energy uh, that is coming onto the grid, uh, things like solar, uh, things like wind. And what we're finding is that uh, hydropower enables those other renewable energy sources to exist on the grid. And, and why I say that is just a couple of words to that. Uh, we don't know when exactly the wind will blow and we don't know when exactly the sun will shine but we have a pretty good sense of uh, in forecasting river and forecasting water and so what that means is we can forecast our fuel uh, to the point where uh, as wind goes up and wind goes down and solar goes up and solar goes down we're able to offset uh, that uh, the hydropower uh, source and as I'm, I'm sure most folks know is uh, AC current uh, cannot be um, stored. So what that means is uh, hydropower is the ultimate and just-in-time uh, manufacturer. Uh, that means when one turns on a light switch, uh, then it needs to be compensated for on the power production side. And when one turns off an aluminum facility or an air conditioner, then that needs to be reduced as well. There's a lot of automation associated with that, but it works the same way uh, on our, um, our source side. So as the sources come up and go down, there needs to be a, a facility that can offset uh, the, the, uh, uh, the uh, sources going up and down. And hydropower is uh, a, uh, a great resource or a great technology to do that. 
The last bullet I want to talk about is the, the micro uh, mini hydro. We're actually seeing a lot of interest in this area. And I think the reason why is, is uh, there's a lot of untapped potential out there. Now, not every uh, small hydro and, and uh, water source uh, is, uh, makes economic sense to, to move forward with micro and, and mini hydro, but there are uh, a number out there which Charlie Allen is going to soon explain uh, some of those uh, things to be looking for uh, when it comes to assessing uh, a potential opportunity for development of micro and mini hydro. So I wanted to talk, you know, the bulk of our work, as I mentioned, our traditional role is large hydro. But the good news about uh, this is it's a scalable experience. The physics itself does not change when you move from large hydro to small hydro. Uh, we've had a number of applications that we've been involved with on very small hydro, 50 kilowatt uh, units, and, and, uh, and uh, large hydro well as well, of course. What we know is that there are similar things, and then there are also unique things. Um, uh, for instance, the, the work that we've done in Afghanistan, uh, they often don't have uh, engineering organizations that, that have the technology or operators that have the, uh, the past experience on, on how to operate power units. And also the uh, environment uh, may be, not be conducive to the latest in technologies uh, due to the, uh, the heat or the sand or other things. And so we take all those things into account and into consideration when we go to um, size uh, and uh, select equipment, we have to take into consideration uh, the, the actual application of uh, the facilities. And again, that's something that uh, we were able to do in HTC. I don't know that uh, Jeanette mentioned this, but um, this, uh, there's a, we're also having a, uh, a second seminar or session uh, next Tuesday. We'll get into more of the specifics of, of hydropower and what to look at, but, but this is uh, a little bit of a commercial. Uh, Charlie Allen is the next speaker. He uh, works here at HTC, our, our senior uh, turbine uh, designer, and uh, Charlie will speak on a uh, little bit. We're going we're gonna to just get into a little bit of the basics on on hydropower. Okay, thank you, John. Yeah, what uh, I'd like to do in the next three slides is talk about, shall we say, the de some of the s details of hydropower. Um, so the first, the first thing here is what I call the power equation. Hydropower, or the megawatts that you get out of a machine, are basically equal to the head times the flow times a proportionality constant. Head is the elevation difference between, shall we say, the upper pool of the dam and then the, the river at the dam outlet. Uh, roughly speaking, you call it the height of the dam, if you will. Uh, it, head can also be in, um, given in terms of pressure in a closed conduit, that is, pounds per square inch of pressure. Flow, on the other hand, um, cubic feet per second, gallons per minute, however you want to refer to it, uh, all it does is change the proportionality constant to accommodate the different units. The critical thing about this qu equation are, first of all, note that it's the head and flow are both linear. There's, there's no exponential term there. There's no uh, increasing return when you either increase the flow or increase the head. It's all just one times the other, and which basically means that if you want to calculate how much power you're going to get from a site, accurate values of head and flow are, are critical to that uh, calculation. And to give you a sense of the size that we're talking about, uh, for a, a sample 100 kilowatt uh, machine or power plant. If you have a 20-foot head, to get 100 kilowatts, you need 74 cubic feet per second or 33,000 gallons per minute. What does that operate? Okay. Um, and to deliver the water to that at a reasonable velocity and reasonable conditions, you need a 4-foot diameter penstock. Um, if we jump to, say, uh, increase the head by a factor of five, 
go to a 100 foot head site where the elevation drop of the water is 100 feet, then you decrease your flow by a factor of five. So we're down to 15 CFS, 6,700 GPM. And in order to, to deliver that water to the machinery at a reasonable rate, uh, you need about a 20 inch diameter penstock or a 20 inch diameter feed pipe. One of the interesting things here is that the physical size of the turbine that produces this energy is approximately proportional to the size of the penstock or the pipe that feeds it. So you see that as we increase the head, the size of the equipment, the size of the infrastructure, everything else decreases proportionately for, for the same power output. Uh, John Ansel just asked me, what's 100 kilowatts? Um, 100 kilowatts is approximately 130 horsepower. Uh, the rule of thumb is that you need about 5 kilowatts to run your average house. So 100 kilowatts is, is 20 houses worth of energy if, when you average it over time. Okay, next slide, Jeanette. Um, this is what I call the benefit equation. When you get right down to it, this is the, the crux of the decision process for whether or not you're going to actually build a, a new hydro generating facility. And the total benefits of a facility of a generating unit over its lifetime is basically equal to the energy that's generated over that lifetime minus the construction costs to build it uh, minus the operating and maintenance costs to run it over its lifetime, and then plus the ancillary benefits. Uh, we on the engineering side of the house can do a real good job of providing values for energy generated over its lifetime, the O&M costs and the construction costs. Where we need to partner very heavily with the installation or the entity that is considering building this new hydropower facility is on trying to get a value of the ancillary benefits. And, and that value can either be qualitative or quantitative. But these ancillary benefits are things like uh, national and army policy objectives for energy security or for energy use reduction, for greenhouse gas emission reductions, or perhaps for the uh, net zero goals that we see coming at us that we're supposed to be targeted to meet in the next five to seven years. And especially when we're talking about um, small hydro or mini hydro, to meet these policy objectives, it's very possible that the ancillary benefits are going to be the primary driver in the go-no-go -no -go decision, superseding the, the considerations or no, superseding the hard numbers that come from simply energy generation and construction costs. So when we're dealing with, shall we say, the fuzzy things of meeting omni policy and how much is it worth to do that in, when compared to the cost of construction and the energy generated, that all has to be uh, analyzed or, or valued out by a team that is, is far beyond what HDC brings to the table. We are simply a part of the team that makes that decision. Okay, next slide. Um, I, this is just a, a quick example of some of the types of installations or some of the installation places where you could install hydro where perhaps it hasn't been installed before. Uh, any place that you've got a water drop or a, a pipe that discharges its water to a, a free space is a possibility. Not necessarily an economically viable possibility, but it is a possibility. Also, any place that you have uh, a pressure reducing valve in a water supply system is, again, a potential place to, rather than simply burning off that pressure, put in a turbine and uh, put that, that extra energy on the grid. Uh, free alt falls from uh, water treatment facilities are another place where perhaps hydropower could be used. Some of the keys with these new technologies are 
You don't need a building to, to house and protect much of the equipment. Uh, pour a pad, cut a hole in the pipe, install your turbine, and keep going. That, of course, is the easy and ideal scenario. Um, there are, are more complicated ones that we need to think harder about. Um, and this is, this is where I get to the pitch for next week's presentation, because uh, next week on the 12th, uh, I will spend a whole lot more time uh, expanding on the types of equipment that can be used. Um, we'll talk about uh, sites that could be considered for development, both uh, closed conduit and open channel. Uh, we'll talk about some e preliminary equations that can be used to s screen. Um, we'll talk about costs and schedules for what it takes to actually install or get this equipment installed and operational. Uh, we'll talk about uh, installation O&M and how much time it takes to run these machines after you get them installed, which is certainly a consideration on, on the downstream side after installation. And so that's about it for me in terms, uh, except to say, come back next week for much more in-depth stuff in terms of the details of the facilities. And now I'm going to turn it back over to Jeanette, I understand, to talk about Great. customer you, interest Charlie in hydropower. And for that. And if you guys can go ahead and mute your microphone again, that'll be great. Um, so hopefully that gives, you, gives everyone on the attending right now a, a little bit of a glimpse of the, the strong expertise that we have within the Corps of Engineers, the amount of hydropower that we ourselves produce, as sometimes that's a mission that not everyone knows about, that we are the largest hydropower producer in the country. So, and then also some of those basic concepts of hydropower. So what I want to talk about is why, why all this new interest in hydropower? Why is there such an increase? And John alluded to that earlier as we know all of the different uh, federal mandates, Army policy, and other DOD requirements that are requiring all of our agencies to look at sustainability and look at renewable energy generation in particular. So um, those are definitely drivers of why we're starting to hear more and more about hydropower and getting a lot more interest in that. There's also a lot of different resources. As Charlie showed the picture of the microhydro applications, there are a lot of different resources across federal land and even uh, in federal facilities where we may have some untapped resources. We may have flood control projects and dams that have been installed that maybe don't have hydropower currently installed in them. It's very unlikely that we're going to be coming in and putting any large-scale hydropower project anywhere, knowing the, the significant environmental challenges associated with getting that type of project approved. It's unlikely that we're going to head that direction. But we may go towards the idea of putting in hydropower into an existing structure, whether it's a Corps of Engineers structure or a structure at a military installation. Um, all of those are different things that everyone is starting to think about and grapple with and try and determine. As we look at all of these different renewable energy options, we're trying to evaluate which is going to be the best one, what's the most cost effective, how will they, the different options for renewable energy help us achieve our specific requirements and mandates. So we definitely in the last year have seen significant increase in interest from our customers and we see that. We're glad to have all of you here on the webinar today. We see that even um, by the attendees that are here. And so we know that that's definitely something that is going to continue to increase. And as John mentioned earlier, there are definitely some positives associated with considering hydropower over other renewable energy sources. We have sustainability centers across the core that also provide expertise in other renewable energy sources. So if you're looking for specific information on other technologies, we can help you with those ones. But as we compare hydropower and the benefits of hydropower or the advantages of hydropower over some of the other renewable energy technologies, John mentioned the, the ability to forecast water water more effectively and water being the fuel of our hydropower, of our power generation and being able to have a more effective forecast of that because of our, our familiarity and ability to um, measure and monitor water levels more effectively than changing weather patterns and changing that would impact our wind or our solar production. 
So there's definitely a, an advantage that can come from that. There are a variety of other, other advantages and challenges that we've got listed there on the slide that are things to consider as we're looking at hydropower. Of course, hydropower is something that is very source dependent. So um, it is it's very location dependent. If you don't have a water resources, resource, then you're obviously not going to be able to provide a hydropower opportunity there. So that, that is definitely one thing to be considering. But where we do have a water resource available, we can think through and with the help of HDC, analyze and determine what are the, the benefits, what is that uh, benefit ratio and that cost-benefit analysis that Char Charlie talked about, looking at the economics associated with it and looking at the ancillary benefits of hydropower and thinking about what is that the right project for that specific location. You see that there are some of these where we have um, both as an advantage and a challenge. So sometimes the environmental impacts could be a lower environmental impact if it's a small scale hydro that we're putting in. And yet even so, sometimes the challenge with hydro can be environmental permitting. And I'll talk a little bit about that in one of the upcoming slides that uh, although hydropower and renewables are definitely something that we are, are all starting to look at and think about more, there are um, things that we have to keep in mind as we go through the process of considering hydropower installed in, in any location. So we call those hurdles to hydropower and some of those different, different things are, are tall hurdles that require a lot of effort to get over and others are pretty low hurdles that we can step over relatively easily. And none of these, our intent of sharing these with you is just to remind everyone that a hydropower is not, neither is solar or wind or other renewable energy technologies. There isn't a quick and easy silver bullet that will help us meet our renewable energy mandates without significant coordination with a variety of different agencies and a variety of different other um, interested parties. So there are definitely things that we have to think about when we're thinking about hydropower compared to another renewable energy. Charlie mentioned the considerations for operation and maintenance. That's something that we'll talk about next week as we look at microhydro and consider for different applications of microhydro, what are the O&M implications associated with the different types of microhydro. And those are things we want to be considering and cognizant of from the outset of a project so that we as a team know what, what all are we taking on and so that we're familiar with all of those pieces. I mentioned earlier the example of where we may have a flood control facility installed and we may want to add hydropower to it. Well, some of those flood control facilities are not authorized to produce hydropower. So some of, again, some of these hurdles are varying, varying heights and varying levels of uh, complexity. Others we can get through pretty easily and make sure that we're able to move forward and move out with, a, with installing hydropower. But this is where we can leverage uh, HDC's capabilities. They can help walk through this process and ask these questions. They will look to the customer to, to look into these and, and get the, the answers, but HDC brings that experience and that knowledge base to know the right questions to ask to help us through the process and make sure that we aren't overlooking anything. We have all of the legal uh, authorizations that we need and we can go ahead and move out and step forward with a hydropower project. So if you have an idea already for a hydropower project and you've got um, plans or ideas of where you think maybe a microhydro might be appropriate for an installation that you're working on or a geographic district, there are, John alluded to this earlier, that um, HDC is not a, what we call a full service district. So HDC has specific capabilities that they bring to, to the team versus what a local district would bring to the team. And so when John was talking about the, the capabilities of HDC, they obviously, as John said, they have the largest uh, conglomeration or con capacity of electrical and mechanical engineers in the Corps of Engineers. So a lot of expertise that they can bring to bear in the specific design and um, development of plans and specs for hydropower facilities. But with that strong, strong technical component, we have to leverage what the local district can provide as well. And so you can see on this slide, we've broken out specific 
basically what the local district has responsibility for versus what the hydroelectric design center would be able to provide for projects. So it is, um, HDC is a team member that comes to be a part of the team, that the team is led by the geographic district. So the district is the one who has the project management role and brings in contracting, environmental, cost estimating, and these other pieces. HDC brings to bear all of their significant hydropower expertise. They can help with uh, full plans and specs and providing some support on the economic analysis as well to determine what the benefits, um, the total benefits equation of hydropower. So it is important we want to engage HDC as our mandatory center of expertise and make sure that we're reaching out to them for these projects. But it's important to acknowledge that their role is as a team member and they're here to be a part of that team where the local district is, has an active role to play as well. So if you have a specific project, whether uh, you're an Army customer or a Corps of Engineers district and you have a specific project that you are already have on your plate and you're thinking, I'm ready to move out and ask some questions. I want to know a little bit more about my project and how viable my project might be. The first step, whether you're a Corps of Engineers um, employee or a customer or whether you're an Army uh, installation, is to reach out to the local geographic district. So reach out to whichever district uh, provides support to you. If you're an Army customer, reach out to that district that provides support to you. And then the program or project manager in both places can reach back to HDC for project-specific support. So that's kind of our, our two-step process to get a conversation initiated with HDC to engage them on a project. You're welcome to contact me. Uh, my information is there at the bottom of the slide as well for general support. If you don't know who the local district is that supports your installation or a civil works, or a military district maybe that doesn't have very much civil works background or uh, civil works mission, you're welcome to uh, reach out to me and I can get you connected with the right folks at HDC to provide that support and get that conversation started. So those are just two quick steps of how we go about getting contact with HDC. Obviously John and Charlie are also available and I've got their contact, John's contact later on in the slide. So all of us are here to help answer any specific questions that you may have as you're getting projects and ideas off the ground and wanting to see validity of those. Is it, worth, is it one that's worth moving forward with? Or maybe you've already done a study and you've already got some background and information or somebody else in AE conducted a study for you and you'd like a technical review. All of those are different components um, that we can provide to provide support as you're thinking about the application of hydropower to help meet your renewable energy mandates. So that's kind of a broad level overview of hydropower, where we're at within the Corps of Engineers. I guess one other thing I'd like to highlight is that HDC being a team member on our team, they are, they are um, a team member that we've got to pay, of course. So it is important to keep in mind that um, we, do, we will need to in, engage in them in detail on projects. We'll have to walk through, as we would with any AE firm, the effort of developing a scope of work and setting a schedule and a budget um, as to be expected with work that we do with any of our districts. HDC is another piece of the Corps of Engineers that we can leverage with strong technical capabilities to support our projects when we're looking at hydropower. So we do have to keep that in mind as well. They're available for the quick, quick question and answers here and there, but as we dive into details of a project or if we want to come out and do any site visits and things, we have to start think, thinking about and looking at scopes and what all is involved in that level of effort and that work. So that is something to consider as well. So a few things that we've talked about through the course of uh, this webinar. I highlighted the centers of expertise at the outset of the presentation. So I encourage you to take a look at that center of expertise website again and start becoming familiar with the different centers and what they have to offer. John provided us the overview of the Hydroelectric Design Center and all of the different capabilities that they can leverage and we can put to use on our projects as well. Charlie gave us a good overview and intro of what uh, is necessary to make a hydropower project work. And again, we're going to go into details next week. Charlie's going to give you a, a good rundown next week, diving into the, the technical details of 
microhydro. So our intent today was just to give a quick overview of what the Corps of Engineers can do with hydropower in particular and the expertise that we have in that capacity. And next week we'll dive into the details of the, the microhydro application specifically. So want to leave that as a um, tease for next week so that hopefully you come back next week and join us as Charlie gives that overview. I've got my contact information and John's contact information there. So if you have any questions um, that we aren't able to answer during the next 10 minutes as we've got time for question and answer, you're welcome to provide those follow up with either John or myself with any questions that you might have. And what I would encourage you to do as we are uh, wrapping up and doing Q&A, if you haven't already, go ahead and chat your question into the Q&A box up on the top left of the webinar. And then also, um, we would like to, Charlie is doing the microhydro presentation next week. We would like to hear if anyone has any particular topics or applications, specific questions that you'd like touched base on next week during the webinar. So we still have a few days this week to make any updates to that uh, material. And so if you have any specific things that you'd like covered, let us know and we would like to be able to address those as much as possible next week for you. So feel free to chat your questions into the Q&A box or you can uh, raise your hand and Jordan can turn on your microphone for you to ask any questions that you may have of what we've covered today. Okay, I would like to confirm at this time that there are no questions. Looks like we just got one. So one question, um, how do the electrical dist electric distribution providers, for example, Southwest Power Administration, play into the modernization of hydropower at USACE dams? So Charlie and John. I But you'll need to unmute. Yeah, this is Charlie. Yeah, we're, we're here. We're just kind of staring at each other, wondering how to answer the question. Um, I, yeah, let, I'll just uh, start. I don't know if we're going to actually address what the uh, the individual is asking, but obviously there's a there's a grid, um, a national grid, and and in many cases, in in most cases, we have a situation where where we install right on directly to the grid. And so what that means is when we produce power, the power itself goes into the grid. So as I mentioned earlier in my presentation, it's a supply and demand. Everything has to equal. So as uh, facilities produce power, that power is shared amongst the grid and shared amongst the users. There are situations or circumstance where things are off of the grid and those would be considered like station service or installation service where they don't they don't intermingle with the grid and so they're their own self-supporting uh, source of electrical power. The ones that, that uh, are the self-supporting, obviously there's no um, external condition or restriction on the power production piece. When um, you actually are tied to the grid, indeed the power marketing agencies such as SWAPA, uh, there's, a, there's a, uh, an engagement or a, a uh, agreement and relationships associated with uh, moving into that process. So did you have anything else to add, Charlie? I was going to come at it from a totally different perspective. The, the power marketing agencies are basically, shall we say, the marketers of federal hydropower to the users. Um, when it comes to funding rehabs um, in the Pacific Northwest with Bonneville Power Administ Administration, we have a unique situation uh, uh, set down by uh, federal statute that allows uh, Bonneville Power Administration to fund rehabilitations in the Pacific Northwest. It, for the other regions of the country served by the other three power marketing associations, administrations, um, frequently those PMAs are a broker, I guess I'd call them, uh, that helps facilitate customer funding 
takes the user's funds, the users decide to contribute to the core to help modernize the core's facilities so we can continue to generate power for them. Um, and I think I'll just let it go at that. That's a different perspective. Did we answer the question? Okay, we have another question from Owen Reed. He asks, what is HDC's role with respect to non-federal hydropower development at USAID's project? This is John Etzel again. So that's, a, that's a great question and actually one that, that uh, we get uh, quite often. So uh, you kind of uh, answered the question when you said it, it non-federal would generally be uh, something that uh, HTC does not get involved with, uh, but let me tell you how we do oftentimes. So it's the district, the geographic district that gets involved with the particular non-federal customer. So a customer identifies, you know, the Corps of Engineers has, I don't know, 400 and some dams, maybe even more on their facilities, and, and uh, developers see that as a great opportunity to tap into because now they don't have to build a dam. And so oftentimes they will, they will come to the Corps of Engineers and say, um, you know, we're interested in tapping into that particular resource. And the Corps is very supportive of that option and that uh, uh, alternative. Uh, we're supportive to the point where uh, it's, it's important for us to uh, support private uh, folks to do that work uh, but it is not our mission, of course, to assure that um, it, it is uh, a, how would I say this, a successful or viable, successful or viable uh, project. We do have a responsibility, the districts have a responsibility to assure uh, life safety uh, and uh, negative damage or impact to a government facility. So review of those types of developments would be focused on those elements. So things like emergency cutoff, things like effect to uh, normal operations are what districts then would review these packets from uh, non-federal uh, entities and assure that uh, the safety and the uh, uh, impact to uh, federal uh, lands are, are, are benign. Um, in many cases, uh, the districts uh, have certain elements of expertise that they can review that and things like water hammer or, or uh, closing uh, the gates quickly or, or shocking, uh, you know, dissipating energy, they don't have expertise for so they would reach back to uh, HDC and ask HDC for a technical evaluation or analysis of that. Again, the focus is not on uh, project operations for the non-federal uh, entity, but the focus is on public safety and the focus is on impact to uh, property and impact to our, our uh, uh, operations. Okay, back to the original question from Mr. Hovel. He would like to know if we can fund improvements under ESPC. Jordan, this is Jeanette. I'll take uh, the first stab at that. And so, um, to my knowledge, we don't have any limitation on allowing ESPC contracts to fund improvements at our facilities. I mean, whether they are hydropower facilities or other facilities, that is what an ESPC or energy savings performance contract is, is for, is to leverage that private party financing. The whole purpose and intent of them is to leverage that financing to, in a situation where we don't have capital funds available to make sustainability, energy efficiency upgrades at our facilities, leverage that private party capital uh, funding at our facilities and make that happen. A couple of constraints that you might find in trying to do that at a hydropower facility, if that hydropower, specifically 
that I have experienced in the Northwestern region for those hydropower facilities that are on station service and that do not pay a utility bill, those, those utility bill savings is how we pay an energy savings performance contractor back or an ESCO, energy services contractor. So if we don't have a bill that we're already paying and they can come in and they can make improvements at our facility and reduce our energy bill, we don't have anything to pay them back with. And that's one of the challenges that we've faced in the Northwestern region in particular is that many of our projects are on station service and so we don't have anything to pay the contractor back with. If you do not have station service and if you do have pay a consistent utility bill, that is something that you could look at and uh, invite the contractors uh, Huntsville provides that service to support ESPC contracts and uh, are doing a variety of different contracts both for Army installations and Corps of Engineers civil works facilities where they can provide that, connect you with energy services companies and get a request for proposal out on the street and see if contractors would be interested in providing those improvements if they can get alternative financing, third party financing successfully because they feel like there's enough improvements to make at that facility that it will save you energy, then that is something that could be considered. If it's just an improvement that will create more energy, typically we don't, like um, Charlie and John were saying earlier, that's all something that's marketed by the Power Marketing Administration. So that's not something that we see any benefit or any result from. So if a ESPC is going to come in and improve your turbines to allow you to produce more power, that isn't, that's unlikely that that would happen through an ESPC because that you don't have a venue to be able to pay them back. Um, so those would be my two, two approaches or two answers to that question. And Jordan, with that, I don't see any other questions that have come in. So unless anyone has, did anybody have any specific items you'd like covered next week for the uh, micro hydro presentation? We definitely would like to be responsive to any specific questions or topics that you want to hear about next week. Okay, well it looks like um, that is it for the questions and thank you all for participating. Once again, I'd like to remind you that this webinar was recorded and it will be posted to our SME website and we look forward to all of you joining us next Tuesday. Thank you.